Welcome to the second episode of Series 18, everyone. We're really excited to dive into the conclusion of our character creation for Descent into Midnight. But first, as usual, some announcements. I hate that you stuck a pun in there still. It's the same pun, too. <laughs> no, last time it was like something about deep or something. I don't know. Oh. Anyway, whatever. I'm still mad at you. <laughs> Gen Con is rapidly approaching, everyone. What? I'm not panicked. It's fine. It's fine. Everything's going to go great. I'm totally ready. <laughs> um, uh, we will be there still. Um, yep. And, you know, we're really excited. Because this is the case, we want to remind everyone, we do have a panel with James D'Amato and Grant Howitt on that Thursday. It'll be at 2 p.m. But also, uh, we'll be really busy getting ready to go to Gen Con before that panel and everything. So we're going to be foregoing the episode on July 29th. You will still get a full bunch of episodes for July. July is one of those months that has five Mondays. Mm -hmm. So you'll still get the full Series 18 plus a Character Evolution cast episode. We're just going to take that 29th off um, to give us a little time to get ready and prepared for our trip to Gen Con. You know, do all of that last minute stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just need time to like curl up in a ball in a corner and panic. <laughs> um, triple check our lists. Uh, but then we'll be back on the 5th with a brand new series, so you can stay tuned for that. Yeah, should be uh, really fun, and I am looking forward to it. So yeah. uh, one last thing that we always like to do when we get to these cold opens together is read your reviews. So if you leave a review for us on Apple Podcasts or any of the other big review services that we have in our show notes, uh, we will read it out. And like we like we are about to do for the review left by Baldnosis. Is that, that how you pronounce that? Bald I like that you ask like somebody's gonna respond. <laughs> I don't <laughs> Well, I apologize if I messed up that name, but I'm gonna say Baldnosis. Uh from iTunes labeled it as the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Well, thanks for tuning in. Um they titled it Excellent Analysis of Various RPG Systems. I would argue if you take two hours to create a fighter and then spend four hours playing that fighter at the table, you've spent six hours playing Dungeons and Dragons. This is a quote from TV's James D'Amato. As a primary, primarily solo gamer, the most joy I experience with a role-playing game is creating different characters using the game's system and then fleshing them out into complex, interesting people. Amelia Entrum and Ryan Bolter employed this very technique, using character creation as a focal point to analyze a game's strengths and weaknesses. Each three-episode season, I think that's supposed to be series, centers around a single game and includes special guests based on their expertise of the game. Featured games range from popular to obscure and from decades-old classics to new games still in development. Between series, the podcast often adds an evolution episode, featuring concepts and ideas to help players have a better role-playing experience. As hosts, Amelia and Ryan are knowledgeable, passionate, and very personable. Aww. Their love and enthusiasm for the subject matter shines through, and it makes the show an enjoyable and rewarding listen. If you're overwhelmed with the number of actual play and GM-centric podcasts, Character Creation Cast will give you a different way to learn about systems and could inspire you to try them on your own. Highly recommended. Oh, thank you. Mm. That was such a nice review. That was a really nice review. Thank you so much, Bald Noses. With all of that out of the way, here's the episode. Enjoy. On the last episode of Character Creation Cast, Taylor was creating a gelatinous and genial seeker, Richard was creating a mailed monstrosity redeemed, and I was creating an invisible and infinite specialist, and Amelia was creating a lith and lustrous empath. We'll be picking up right where we left off last time. Enjoy. So we all have our looks. Yep. 
Now we're going to choose our gifts, attitude, and home. Ooh. Just like looks, these are like story instructions. They are jumping points. They are your springboard to dive into Descended to Midnight. Um, so you get two gifts. These are either um, like psionic abilities that you have. They could be bioengineered, like things that you have created. They may just be aspects of your physical evolution. Um, your attitude is, you know, I, I think it's valuable for maybe your first session. You might toss it out the door after that, if mm -hmm. you've defined your character enough. Uh, but those are just some, um, words that might inspire you to play, uh, your, your playbook. And then your home is, uh, a, maybe a place in your community or outside of your community where you have come from, which kind of gives you an idea of where your creature might live. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, that one's easy. Yeah, I got mine. Hmm. I think I've got mine. I don't really know what I'm doing with this character, but I'm just going to pick things that I like, and we'll see what happens. There you go. Heck yeah. That's a great strategy, mm -hmm. because I think that if you come in knowing exactly the concept of what you want to play, um, the experience might be a little bit lessened compared to if you come and choose the options that you want to have and then find a way to make those options work to towards a concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course this is a situation where do as I say, not as I do because I've already picked my concept and I'm trying <laughs> to shoehorn my options into it. Yep. You've had a lot more time to think about this than the rest of us though. <laughs> <laughs> believe it or not, this is only the second descent into my night character that I've ever made. I totally believe that. Um, I have run dozens, if not maybe a hundred games at this point, <laughs> but I've only played in yep. one of them. <laughs> As a designer, it is extraordinarily <laughs> hard to play the game you are designing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I feel like everybody said, all of the designers we've had on have kind of said that, like, oh, I haven't really had a chance to sit down and make characters in my own game. It's like, mm -hmm. well, now you can. Mm -hmm. Do we all have our stuff picked? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All, All right. right. Who wants to go first? Uh, I can start it off. Sure. Sure. Uh, okay. So we have uh, this character who is living mostly in the Echo and is attaching themselves to uh, the discarded remnants of the computer clams. Um, so their two gifts are um, going to be a malleable body. Uh, because most of their body exists in the echo. Um, and the bit that is hanging out in the physical world, um, is just an anchor, uh, and then perfect camouflage because at any point they can just sort of let go. Um, and I think they risk floating off, uh, and not being able to reconnect to the physical world, but, uh, those shells just sort of fall to the seafloor and hang out there. Uh, and they're effectively Ooh. invisible. Um, if they need to be, um, I think their attitude is angry. Um, at first, I don't know that, um, maybe they might not know exactly why they're here. Um, or, or there, there's definitely things that we could flesh out, um, as we do more world building. Um, and their home is of course, uh, between spines and spires, calm currents, simple beginnings, or the boneyard. Uh, it is 100% the boneyard because this is, you know, <laughs> clam skeleton golem. That's awesome. Heck yeah. Are those clams uh, my family? I mean, not <laughs> they are. I've they're decided. Not. Yeah. I've decided. Nice. Uh, so I chose echoic illusions and reality tunneling. Ooh. Yes. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. And so I think that like, as I am the membrane between our world and the echo, I have to find ways to interact with both, wor both worlds. So I use my illusions to like create avatars, like almost, um, like light images, uh, as, as light, uh, echoes through the moving water i can like bend it and like warp it and tunnel it into uh hard shapes so that might be how i interact with either world um my attitude is soft so i am like i i think you know a good soft friend um and my home is the bubble city and i am going to twist that and say that i am the bubble city Ooh. <laughs> 
That's amazing. Thank you. All right. Uh, for me, uh, for my gifts, I chose multi-sense and sound projection. And what I'm interpreting that as, since I exist across all physical surface of uh, this world, I can sense everything simultaneously in the world. Um, and then I use my sound projection to to amplify the harmonics of the echo itself as it comes into this world so that it creates a very uh, harmonious experience for the those living in the physical portion of the world. Mm, it's very cool. Yeah, it's really interesting to have like characters who are sort of at the intersection, like living at that threshold as opposed to on both sides of it or one side of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I picked shadow manipulation. Nice. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's on brand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm doing my best. Uh, <laughs> and then I'm also going to take animal influence. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Um, for my attitude, I picked Radiant. Mm. And for my home, I picked Within a Place of Importance. I am a princess clam. Nice. Oh, my God. I am the clam queen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forgot to do my attitude in home. Um, my attitude was probing, uh, which is very applicable to sensing everything. Mm -hmm. um, and my home, I, I have between a snug crevasse, a dirty hole too many teeth or a family <laughs> legacy. Um, I think I originally wrote down a family legacy, but I think I'm going to put in too many teeth instead. Mm. Um, and I'm going to interpret that as since I exist everywhere, I'm a little everywhere, a little too much everywhere. Interesting. Are you Are starting you to get overwhelmed by it? I think so. Ooh. And I, th I think that has really interesting implications for, like, because your character has such a direct um, connection to the world and the community already, like, corruption that your character experiences or that is in the community, like, it it's very easy to see how that would move back and mm -hmm. forth between those. And I can see, depending on the type of corruption, my character accidentally amplifying it at first mm -hmm. thinking it's part of the echo yeah that's oh, really cool we'll get there yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh what i'm doing is killing people i know <laughs> okay so next do we get to do links we should say so, we all have stats yes um so now we are going to open up our playbooks um we all have stats that are laid out as they are mm -hmm. um take a look at your stats think about what that might mean for you as a, a character what that might mean for you as a role player um and then we are going to be picking some of our moves so every playbook gets a signature move which will always be up front up first uh it's going to have maybe multiple moving parts you might be choosing bits to um to customize your signature move um so take a look read over that uh and then um you are going to also choose two other moves from your playbook so this might be some dead air that whoever edits this show cuts out that's mm. me this I'm part anyway <laughs> yes this part <laughs> oh dane Nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. That goes perfect with my concept. So I have to pick it. I just cannot, like, mash this into something yet. Uh, princess Clam. Mm hmm. With animal control. I mean, you could be an underwater Disney princess clam. I know, and that's so not my vibe. <laughs> <laughs> but you could be. With shadow manipulation, you can mm -hmm. you could be an evil Disney princess clam underwater. So <laughs> the cool thing, one of the cool things about the empath is that you pick two emotions that you don't know how to process. Mm -hmm. 
Ooh. So I encourage you to take a look at your signature move and choose choose those and see if that helps to solidify some of the concepts of what does a character who doesn't quite know how to process these specific emotions, what does that character look like, feel, do mm. in this world? And by picking those emotions, you are signposting to your your guide, hey, hit me with these a lot, because mm-hmm. that's when mechanics happen, and we all know that mechanics are the fun part of games. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wink, wink. So are these <laughs> things that I'm not able to, like... That you have a difficult you have a difficult time understanding those emotions. Gotcha. Yeah. So anytime that you do, or maybe not a difficult time, but maybe you have a particularly um, like nasty history with those emotions, mm-hmm. or maybe there is a piece of the corruption that lives within you that is like amplified by those emotions. Um, mechanically, anytime that you finish a scene where those emotions are present, uh, you're going to finish that scene by resisting corruption. Ooh. Yeah. I gotta pick my second one here. Oh, okay. I think mm, I'm stuck between two of them. That's a good sign. Y'all, these playbooks are good. <laughs> they are good. Right? It turns out. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna yeah, go. Yeah, this is really hard for me. I just I'm realizing now that like the empath is not at all like the kind of character I usually play. Mm-hmm. I think that's why I'm having a hard time. It's okay. <laughs> we're trying out new things. We are trying out new. Yeah. Things. And we, I encourage you to step outside your comfort zone in a, you know, safe and controlled way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with a character I never have to follow through on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's very true. All right. Does it, uh, are we all sorted? I've got mine all set. Yeah, I'm all set. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'll lock these in. <laughs> I'm good to go. All right, Taylor, do you want to tell us what you picked? Yeah, so my choices were very easy to make because there are some moves that fit exactly within kind of the concept that I laid out in when I was talking about my looks and everything. Um, so my signature move is Tides of the Future. When you spend downtime contemplating the far echo, you receive enigmatic dreamlike glimpses into the flow of the universe. I get to roll plus community. Uh, on a hit, you are flooded with images of other realities, distant pasts, and potential futures. Uh, on a seven to nine, I mark a condition and hold two potential. Uh, on a 10 plus, I hold three potential. And on a six minus, my visions show insight, but leave me unsettled. I have to resist corruption and gain plus one forward. And then with that potential, there are some cool options that I get to do. So I get to hold on to those as if they were just like tokens or currency to spend later uh, for what could it mean to spend one potential to describe something I remember about my vision. Um, Do we want to just like read these out or like how? Yeah, let's go for it. (laughs) <laughs> uh, so describe something I remember about my vision. This could be a glimpse of the past, present, or future, um, or of another plane of existence, or be a dreamlike metaphor. Uh, the guide will then add additional details to my memory. I get to take plus one forward and acting on the results of that vision. Nice. Um, I could also spend two potential to say this looks familiar. Um, my vision involves a potential future that is coming to pass and I may act to to change it. Mm. Um, If an ally rolls a six minus, I can spend two potential to treat it as a seven to nine. Um, I can describe what should have happened and how I act to change those events. But then I have to resist corruption. Um, I could then also spend three potential to... um, to show my vision involved a potential future that is coming to pass and I may act to change it. I can spend three potential when an ally rolls a six minus. If I do, I, that can treat that result as a 10 plus uh, and then resist corruption at the end of that move. Nice. Mm-hmm. So that's my signature move is just like getting visions of the future, acting to change them. Um, and then the two moves that I chose uh, on the outside of that are what dreams become Most inhabitants believe the echo is only a reflection of the physical world, but I understand that the opposite is also true. Uh, When I manipulate my silhouette to alter my physical form, I roll plus drive and then choose a look from any playbook and describe how the new appearance has, er, and describe the new appearance you have during the scene. Um, 
And then just just like potential, I get to hold something called facade. And I can spend that facade to uh, have some options like choosing a basic move to get plus one ongoing, to distract, frighten, or surprise those around me, to move unhindered to any place within the scene, or, or I can spend two facade to take a six minus uh, when I endure or resist corruption. And those are moves where you want to roll low. Very nice. And then my second move is Seek the Horizon. When I send my silhouette to observe another location, I can roll plus drive. Uh, on a hit, I mark a condition and observe the location as if I were there. Uh, on a 7 to 9, I get to choose two of these options, and on a 10 plus, I choose three. I remain undetected. I flow with the psychic tides and do not mark a condition. I remain aware of my physical body's surroundings, and the silhouette of one or more allies may accompany me. Nice. That gets really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I love this and playbook. <laughs> heck yeah. Like my favorite one. <laughs> it's so good. All right. Um, so for the redeemed, um, their signature move is called Heart of Violence. Conflict, verbal, physical, or psychic, is where you feel the most at home. You might not seek out violence, but when challenges arise, you know what has to get done and how to do it. In your mind, you wish the world would remain at peace, but in your heart, peace is often the calm before the storm. And you actually get to choose one of two options. Uh, the option I am choosing is called Stormfront. When you appeal to your allies to help restrain you from rash or violent action, ask your friends if they hold you back. If they do, soothe your violent nature and you clear corruption. If they Ooh. don't, gain plus one ongoing in the ensuing conflict. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's the uh, very much the the Hulk move. Uh, the other option is gives you more of a Captain America feel, I guess. Nice. Um, uh, so the second move I took was Hell's Heart. You have vowed revenge for a heinous wrong. Tell the guide who wronged you and choose one consequence. Uh, I'm going to pick from the list dangerous odds. Whenever you act in accordance with your obsession and suffer the chosen consequence, resist corruption, then mark harmony or take plus one forward. When you defeat the one who wronged you, mark harmony. When you declare forthcoming vengeance, choose a new target for this move. Um, cool. And I, I think the the what i've got in mind for this is um the species that this character is from uh live sort of mostly in the echo and sort of have an anchor to the physical world and someone or something has been severing the connections of their kin uh from the physical world um and they have been unable to stay near this world and so they have floated off into the deeper parts of the echo uh never to be seen again hmm. um the second move uh is sense weakness you identify weak points in everyone friend or foe when you first encounter a new ally predator or other notable creature you may ask the guide one question about them they must answer truthfully um, we just did a recording where, uh, cat was playing a redeemed, um, and used that move beautifully to do some really interesting things. Um, so I'm excited to, to see how that would pair up with all of this. Nice. What about you, Ryan? All right. Uh, for my signature move, it's, uh, get the job done. Uh, nothing distracts you from the task at hand. When you scan the environment, you may roll with Calm instead of Community, and my Calm is at a plus two, which is nice. Additionally, when you act as a team to prepare for an infiltration of, or rescue from, or travel through treacherous or unpredictable locations, add Calm to the result to the results of your roll. On a hit, you and your allies gain access, but it's up to you to get out. Yeah, and we actually updated the move recently. I think um, right now it's you pick two out of a list, and one of the options is uh, you you get what you came for or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think the newer version of that is you get to pick like one, and that option is no longer there, um, or some, something along those lines. I don't remember the interesting because basically it's like the oh here's the skip the fun move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. It's, it's more, I think we, we weighted it more towards 
you get into the thing and what are some things that are going to affect you on the way out or like, Mm -hmm. you know, once you get in great, but, um, yeah, that makes sense. The snowball going from there. Cause like we literally had that where it was like character rolled that move and it was like, like, I guess we have the thing. So there's no drama now. It killed that Mm -hmm. momentum. What are your other? So my other moves that I selected was safety net. When something doesn't go to plan, you react with instinct and training. When an ally rose, rolls a six minus on a basic move, you may mark a condition and describe how you help them. If you do, the ally may consider the roll a 10 plus, which right. is remarkable. Um, although that'd be a horrible thing to use on the, what is it, resist corruption move? Yeah, yeah. you don't generally <laughs> want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's make it worse. Yeah. Um, That's my kind then, of game. Yeah. And then the other move that I chose was not on my watch. And this one says, you are an expert at defending the innocent and using your surroundings to your advantage. Whenever you use the environment to defend an inhabitant, roll plus hope. Uh, and on a hit, choose one. I can uh, create advantages for my allies. Um, an inhabitant moves to a place of safety temporarily immobilize or incapacitate the opposition or acquire something out of reach. I thought both of those fit in very well with my, my role in this world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So my playbook move is channel as a conduit of emotions. You recognize which psychic burdens are yours to carry and which are not. You're intimately familiar with the corruption and its influence on you. Whenever you clear a condition, you may instead clear a corruption. Certain experiences are more difficult for you to filter. These may be born from powerful personal experiences you've yet to master, or from lack of exposure to the extremes of mental and physical suffering. Choose two of the following hardships. I picked, um, hold on, I wrote them down over here. I picked anguish and despair. Mm -hmm. And... Um, When you are in the presence of a sentient creature suffering from one of your chosen hardships, you gain insight into the internal worlds of those around you, but risk taking some of their experiences as your own. At the end of any scene in which you are exposed to a hardship, mark harmony and resist corruption. And then there's lots of mechanics that I'm not going to talk about. Lots of numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I also picked... Uh, sorry, I'm trying to t- make notes in one thing and then look at the thing. Um, I picked lead by example. When you endanger yourself by taking the lead, choose one. Your bravery and conviction centers you. Clear condition. Your teammate may describe how your action inspires them. If they do, they clear condition. Your action reveals something fundamental about your nature. Mark harmony. You implement a subtle but important plan. Grant a teammate one maneuver. Hmm. And... I picked, uh, I picked, uh, synchronicity. When you act as a team, you link your allies in psychic landscape, allowing them to act as one synchronous being. You may mark corruption to treat a six minus result as a seven to nine or resist corruption to treat seven to nine as a 10 plus. Yeah. So I'm thinking that, um, Richard, all of your, all of your little clams that are right. It's yours mm-hmm, that are mm-hmm. tethering yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, those might be my family. <laughs> um, my clam, my clam family. So I'm, I'm thinking that I've, I've lived this life of privilege. Um, but whatever this corruption is, is ruining that. Um, and so now I'm having to deal with all of the negative emotions around that. Mm-hmm. Um, and trying to fix it, um, possibly selfishly. We'll see. If only we had a cultivator, because then when we were hanging out in the garden, my character could be all like, when you hear you clamily. <laughs> yep. <laughs> nope. You took You're my fired joke. From this podcast. You took my joke. I was going to say clamily. Fired. Oh. Oh, boy. Nope. That, Disinvited. Yep. I've got uh, I've got fifty percent veto power on that. I don't know if that that matters when it's uh, when there's only two. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that it works like that. <laughs> on my podcast, I welcome puns. Mm. Mm. All right. 
Uh, so is that everybody for those for the moves? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So uh, we also have on the back of the playbook uh, a section called team moves. Um, so you actually get both of these. The idea behind them is to uh, encourage positive interaction and healing interaction between the characters. Um, so I'll go first. Uh, this is for the redeemed. So the first one is team player. When you offer earnest praise to a friend, clear a condition. And the second is guardian. When you use violence to prevent direct harm to an ally, clear a corruption. Hmm. Yeah, for mine, I have and ignite your bones. <laughs> that one was wow. all Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds correct. That is a very Taylor uh, name for a team move. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and ignite your bones says when you put yourself at risk to bring a lost or injured inhabitant to safety, clear a corruption. If the inhabitant was a PC, your actions give them hope and they also clear a corruption. Ooh, that's very nice. Mm -hmm. um, and then my other team move is a common current. When you find common ground with an ally, adversary, or rival, mark harmony. Ooh, those are very nice. Yeah, and they're they're meant to, you know, like I said, to kind of fuel those positive interactions and help you clear conditions and corruption in a way that um, is uh specific to your playbook and sort of the arc that that they try for mm -hmm. uh my team moves are look deeper when you expose someone to their hidden truth they may clear a condition and positive reinforcement when you celebrate a victory with a close friend clear a corruption mm. very cool and taylor what are your team moves my team moves are epiphany when you share a moment of clarity about yourself, your community, or the universe with an ally, clear a corruption or mark harmony. And I also have see what I see. When you share the mythology or symbolism of the echo with someone, ask if they connect to your story. If they say yes, ask them to describe how your story gives them insight, and they clear a corruption. If they say no, mark harmony. Hmm. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. All right. So now do we get to do the links? Because I'm oh, pretty yeah. excited about the, those. The links <laughs> are, I think, where the characters really start to develop. Yes. Mm -hmm. We need names first, though, don't we? We do. We need names and pronouns, actually. Oh, man. <laughs> Every time. Every time you make all these characters and we have to name them. Look, I left the book on the desk this time, at least. I don't, I don't even know if you need the book for <laughs> no um in my first game i let aaron amandola name my character as part of the like one of the questions um mm -hmm. back and forth was um was something about like they were the first one that found me or something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. um and totally named my character scrup <laughs> scrup oh That's yeah. awesome. scrup so uh That's that was cool yeah my my wife uh the first time the only time that she's really played a role-playing game was to send it to midnight uh at a catacon last year mm -hmm. um mm. and she played the sentient coral that made up the community mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. was nameless and yeah. i think somebody gave her a, a name during the the one shot which was really cool which i, yeah. I gotta say like I think I think we've had maybe two people where this was like one of their first role playing game experiences, and I'm like, that is so bizarre. It's wild. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, like I'm trying to imagine like going, ah, yes, I have heard of the dungeons and the dragons. What is this thing? I would like <laughs> you to know? play your underwater fish horror now. Yes, yes please. Uh -uh. Hmm. All right. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and start off with the first one with uh, the redeemed, and I, I'm really, really tempted to to call them Shelley. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please do it. Okay. We're going to go with that because it's it's that kind of game, and, That's and the amazing. best part is, you know, you you can go, you know. Um, I mean, you, you can do anything from, you know, Bob, if you really want to, uh, to something like, you know, um, the, the pressure of the wave that, 
that arrives at high tide or something, you know, like even cause, because the way that the inhabitants communicate with each other through the echo uh, images and feelings are just as valid as sounds. Um, but, but Shelly's a good pun and I, I have to. So, uh, so yes, this is mm-hmm. Shelly, um, for pronouns, we're going to go they, them. And, uh, for their first link, this will segue into it. Um, you lost emotional or physical control during a stressful situation. Blank saw you. What was their reaction? So who do we think saw Shelly having a hard time? Probably me. All right. And who are you? uh, uh, Let's see. So I am piecing together my name right now. Uh, See, this is even harder than like regular names because there's like an infinite amount of choices. I don't do well. If it helps, my character's name is going to be Bub, Bub. and that's short for bubble. Oh. Mm So just like sense. lean into whatever your brain tells you. And and the best part is that you can have like the sillier the name, the more you're going into it thinking, oh, this is all going to be happy fun times. And then um, and then you yeah. come across the corruption and go, oh, gee, this is bad. And then you come together and like you have these beautiful, wonderful experiences and these characters and they're named Bub and Shelly and, you know, the light on the seafloor. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. So I, my character is more of a concept mm-hmm. to the society and not so much as uh, something that is physically there. They're more of a, like a feeling and a thing that can communicate. Um, we just going to call you boost mobile. <laughs> boost. Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> I will not be an advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boost stationary. Yeah. Oh, what about what about um boost omnipresent? <laughs> Probably not. No. <laughs> That's even bad for me. <laughs> Ooh, we can look up this list of enigmatic baby names. <laughs> Oh my. <laughs> what the hell is an enigmatic baby name? Does this baby exist? We don't know. Is it even a baby? Is it just a small man? Oh boy. All right. So I'm going with that which exists amongst all, but also none is my name. I don't know what you want to call that for short, though. I'm sorry, the what now? That which exists among all, but also nowhere. Interesting. Um, Tweeban would be the acronym. I like that. T-W-E-A-A-B-A-N. Tweeban. 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 I like it. (laughs) All right. So, uh, Tweeban, uh, saw... Shelly, during uh, a stressful situation, lose emotional or physical control. Um, what was their reaction? Um, I'm going to say uh, Tweeban, um, who I would, goes with uh, both singular and plural um, they, them pronouns. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, probably would have had a curious reaction to it. Mhm. Like uh this is this is something that I don't see often. Okay. Let me let me uh let me observe this. Okay. Do did they make their presence known to um Shelley at the time or were they sort of observing from sort of afar? I think I think so. I think uh Tweeban made their presence known at that moment. Okay. Um, I think given sort of what I've got in mind for um, Shelly, I can imagine that like this could have been a moment where another one of their kin sort of had been cut off from um, the physical plane and had drifted out into the echo and they'd been unable to, to bring them back. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I think like, they were sort of despondent and um, 
put themselves at risk somehow. Okay. So I think we would definitely explore that more in play and sort of leave that as a, a nice big juicy hook for the guide. Absolutely. Ooh, I, <laughs> I've got another one. Um, okay, go y- for it. Your prized possession was given to you by blank. Um, what does it signify to you and why? Um, so, so these clam shells that are, um, your family, um, are they like specifically all your family or are they more like your people that include your family? Or if you're, if you are sort of a form of royalty, would you have sort of like, um, like bodyguards or something like that, or people like assigned to sort of support you because I, I could imagine that like Shelly goes to take a, you know, goes to, to the boneyard to collect some of these shells for themselves. And there's a moment where, um, it means something special because it was someone special to you. Mm hmm. Um, yes, I really like that. Mm hmm. So how how do you imagine that like that happened? Was it something where uh, oh do you have do you have a name yet? We can we can figure that out. Oh, um, I picked Amaryllis. Amaryllis, I love that. Okay, so yeah, so was it something where like Amaryllis sought out one of the shells of someone important to them for Shelley, or do you think it was that Shelley came across it and? like recognize sort of the signature of someone important to you. Um I think yeah, I mean I think it's I think it's more the first one. I think that th- the loss of these people around me is mm-hmm. really like it's confusing and scary and sad. Mm-hmm. And um I think Emerilus is like attempting to hold on to that somehow. Okay. And is like, well, at least this is useful and alive somehow interesting because i i can also see like maybe part of the thing that lets them connect to um to anchor to these shells is the way that like there's almost like an echo or a a a, a little bit of the spirit of those inhabitants that like lingers a little bit and sort of like there's an easing of like their emotions and their personality sort of like um influence yes. um influence them and maybe like there's like a i could imagine it could be like there is calm and presence um in generally with your species like they're they're good at um at that and that's part of why they work so well for shelly is because like they have to like they need to control their anger and that's one of the ways that they help themselves do that Oh, I really love that. Because I remember, like, one of the things that I loved about our game at a catacomb, mm-hmm. too, was that, like, the the cities were built in the shells of, like, these dead crabs. But mm-hmm. they, like, the sections of the city took on the personality of oh, that yeah, crab. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I had totally forgotten about that part of it until just now. Yeah. But, like, I love <laughs> the idea of, like, soaking in the emotions of, mm-hmm. oh, that's really good. Yes. All right. So who else has got a link? I've got one. There is a spirit in the echo following blank. What do you know about the spirit and why haven't you told them about it yet? I love this question. This is such (laughs) a good question. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Uh, I think it's following Amaryllis. Mm. Uh Uh-oh. Um, and, oh, here we go. So you're a clam, Mm -hmm. right? This spirit is a pearl. Oh, Oh. Nice. But right now, I almost swore it's a piece of didn't. sand inside of it's you. It's what? I said, right now, it's only a piece of sand inside of you. Oh. So this spirit is the future of that piece of sand. Wow. Dang. Okay. What? But I can't tell you about it. Oh, man. Because if, I, if you knew, it may not become the pearl. Oh, that's so good. Nice. Oh, dang. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's awesome. You have one? I got one. Okay. Um, you know something about Blank's past? Uh, what do you know? How did you uncover it? Do they know? And if so, what was their reaction? Um, I think I want this to be about Bub's past. Um, mm. What do I know? Um, how you were born. 
Oh, interesting. Mm. Like how the, the moment you were created because I was there. Do you know it already? I like the way this is worded because it's, it could be read in one of two ways. It could be either I know how I was born or I know that you mm-hmm. know how yeah. I was born. And either way is interesting. That is interesting. Okay. Um, I don't know how I was born, I guess. Interesting. That's cool. But Ryan, how was I born? (laughs) (laughs) I'm imagining this world that has almost pure echo in it throughout the the world. Nothing inhabitable because of that, aside from creatures within the echo. What if I created it, created Bub? to create a sanctuary for the physical world. Mm. Whoa. I'm happy with That's that. That's real good. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, I-, I can just imagine like the, the story that we could tell about this, where it's like the physical world is something you have manifested and the corruption is, could be unimaginably horrifying, right? Of just like something that is trying to, to take that away and restore balance to things but would also destroy everything that you've created in the process Mm. oh and what if what if um like all of your uh redeemed or or friends and family Mm -hmm. that are getting pulled into the echo deeper and deeper Mm -hmm. are just adding to the problem of the echo wanting to push back in yeah Mm. because like because my species like lives at like tethered to the physical world it's like the thing that like i wonder if like it's a safety mechanism almost of Mm -hmm. like they they are they have to stay tethered to that otherwise they sink back out and they like push the boundaries in yeah on the physical world oh oh my god okay (laughs) so it's not just about like oh you know my species is you know going off and they're no longer seen again it's that when they do they like they are pushing back like the walls of this physical universe or this physical world Mm -hmm. so i want to kind of tie some of this together a little bit Mm -hmm. um the question i want to do is you drew the corruption from an ally and channeled it to defeat a threat who did you draw it from and what did you learn about them Ooh. Um, so I want to go with Shelly. Okay. And I think what I learned is the fact that you need these shells to help calm you. Mm-hmm. And thus the gift to like yeah. keep you keep you sane and sort of controlled a little bit. That mm-hmm. like this is a thing that you can't necessarily do do on your own and you need these other pieces and that's why it's so important okay yeah that's really cool and like i i feel like also like shelly knows that like they they have started to realize that by maintaining control and by figuring out this problem they're literally saving the existence like of you and everyone in the physical world but I think this is also really complicated for me because those are my dead family members. Yeah. So, like, the only thing that is stopping the world from exploding is the fact that my family is dead. Yeah. And, like, that's not cool. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I'm sure that, like... Or is it indeed the coolest yeah. thing? Well, and it's, like, in the, in the long campaign, like, one of the... Um, one of the things you can do is you can you can say okay like i think it's one of the corruption moves where it's like you can say i do the thing and then this is the end of my character like Mm -hmm. i could easily see that being a thing where it's like amaryllis could if you know if the story went that way like become a a significant part of shelly in a moment where like that needed to happen that could be really cool yeah that kind of ties in with the question that I just found the answer to. Mm-hmm. Um, you and Blank spent significant time together discussing Blank. Mm-hmm. Um, I was thinking myself and Amaryllis spent significant time together talking about death. Interesting. Um, why are you each drawn to the subject? Uh, probably Amaryllis because of the stuff that you were just saying there. 
And well, and also those are like the emotions that I'm not super great yep. at are like mm-hmm. anguish. Yeah. And-, and then me, because I don't know death personally. Oh, dang. Because even if the physical world collapses and everything else is gone, you will still remain. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Death would and be welcome cool. relief. <laughs> and like, where does that, where would that leave, um, Bub too? Like, yeah, I don't know that I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the membrane between our world and the echo. But if our world stops, what happens to you? I mean, you, you could shrink into a point. I'm a membrane between the echo and whatever's on the other Nothing. side. Oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> love to feel the void against my s- gelatinous <laughs> skin. Yeah. Ugh. <sighs> All right. Well, we did it. We made some people. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, we are definitely not going and and kicking in doors and killing goblins with with these folks. <laughs> no. no, definitely not. Oh my goodness. I I love right. these characters. Yeah, I do too. So, uh for next time we will take care of the community. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. uh then discuss this uh this wonderful wonderful uh train wreck waiting to happen of a world Mm -hmm. absolutely awesome i love it so much all right well thank you so much for joining us for our descent into midnight character creation episodes uh taylor do you want to go ahead and remind people where they can find you online absolutely uh i encourage you listener to follow me on twitter at leviathan files you can also check out all the things that i do at riverhousegames.com including a semi-curated list of queer and lgbt plus tabletop rpg resources articles videos games etc um you can find the podcast that i run game closet on itunes please 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 listen rate review uh it's a very fun show with awesome uh korean lgbt plus tabletop folks uh you can find the games that i write outside of descent to midnight at riverhousegames.itch.io and again just a reminder if you're listening to this before the end of metatopia 2019 all of my games are half off or you can get all of them in a bundle for twenty dollars that price is not going to change even if i add Add more games to that bundle, which I absolutely nice. will. And Richard, what about you? Where can people find you? Uh, so people can find me on Twitter at R Kreutzlandry. That's R K R E U T Z L A N D R Y, uh, which is basically where I live. Um, you can also find my origami work, uh, including diagrams, and uh, a few of the smaller games I've worked on at origamigaming.com. And, of course, uh, if you're looking for Descent into Midnight content, you can go to www.descentintomidnight.com or at D-I-M-R-P-G on Twitter. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to listen. And please join us next episode when we break the format a little bit and create a community before we discuss how amazing this game is. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time.
we got to read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Session Zero. Session Zero is a discussion podcast that seeks to explore the psychology of role-playing. Each episode will feature RP concepts, stories, and tropes viewed through the lens of psychology by clinical psychologist Porter Green and industrial organizational psychologist Steve Discount. Join us on the couch for the next session.